All right, so yesterday we talked a lot about basicity and nucleophilicity, and we said that a good nucleophile is something that is unstable, not bulky, and has a small activation energy. A good base is pretty similar. It's also something that's unstable, but size doesn't matter as much. And what we're looking for with basicity is creating a product that is more stable than our starting material, so that drop in delta G. We said when we're looking at nucleophilicity, sterics matters a lot. So if you have something that's really unstable but bulky, it's just simply not going to be a good nucleophile because it takes up too much physical space. Smaller nucleophiles tend to be much better. And then we looked at stability too, and we'll come back to that today. We said stability is impacted a lot by the solvent that things are in, um, specifically as you're going up and down a column. If you're looking at nucleophilicity and aprotic solvents, we get more nucleophilic as you go up a column. Um, and then more nucleophilic as you go down a column in protic solvents. And then we looked at basicity, which was pretty similar. And we said we want our base to be unstable, so follow the cardio rules um, and review chapter three if you need to. We said that sterics and salvation play a very minimal role in basicity, though. They play, play a much bigger role in nucleophilicity. All right, and then we finished up talking about what if we want a base that isn't a good nucleophile? And we said option one was pick something that's really bulky. Option two was to use DBN or DBU. These are both bases that don't even have a negative charge, but their conjugate acid is resonance stabilized. So that makes them really good bases, but crummy nucleophiles. And then option number three was where we finished up. We said that if you use an insoluble base, um, it can only do surface acid-base chemistry. However, it doesn't have the ability to go into solution and act as a nucleophile. And the classic example of this was hydride bases. Hydride bases are nice because they uh, evolve hydrogen gas, which is easy to remove from solution. It just bubbles out. Um, and it doesn't dissolve well, which means it doesn't act as a good nucleophile. All right, so now let's do the opposite side. What if we want a strong nucleophile that isn't a good base? that isn't basic. All right, so this is the other side of that same coin. So let's take a look at that. The first one is pretty easy, halogens. What I mean by halogens is not fluoride, but chloride, bromide, and iodide. These all have negative charges, which means they can be a pretty decent nucleophile, but why are they not good bases? They like remaining ions, right? They're the conjugate base of strong acids, which means that they're really crummy bases, right? So that's pretty simple. So these are conjugate bases of strong acids. This makes them pretty decent nucleophiles because they have an abundance of electron density, but not good bases because they're very stable on their own. All right, the other one that we occasionally run into are sulfur-containing compounds. And so what I mean by that is you could have something like a negative charge on a sulfur, and that sulfur could be bonded to a hydrogen, or it could be bonded to some sort of carbon group, so I'll label that as an R. Or this can even be some sort of thiol, like that, where you just have lone pairs sticking out. Why are sulfur-containing compounds really good nucleophiles? Does anybody remember? Think about the electronegativity. Is sulfur very electronegative? Not really, not even close to oxygen. So in this case, it's not gonna hold its lone pairs tightly to itself. Instead, its lone pairs are gonna be hanging out in space, which makes it a pretty good nucleophile. Conversely though, because sulfur is so big, it's really, really stable as an anion, right? So these are really stable, even though they are anionic, which makes them poor bases. However, they've got a lot of electron density that's available, so they can act as pretty good nucleophiles. So 
let's make a note. Sulfur is not very electronegative. which means its lone pairs are not held tightly. That makes some pretty good nucleophiles. All right, so this is where things get confusing, right? Is identifying what makes a good nucleophile a good nucleophile, what makes a good base a good base, and there's somewhere there's actually overlap between the two. Okay, so let's make a list. And over here I'll do good base only. So that'll be our first column. This next one will do both a good base and nucleophile, meaning they can perform either role. Next one will do good nucleophile only. And then the last one will do weak base, weak nucleophile. So we've got four main categories that we need to go through. All right, so we already went over the good bases yesterday that aren't good nucleophiles. We said a good example of that was a bulky base, the most classic of which is potassium terbutoxide. And if you remember, this is often abbreviated KOTBU or TBUOK. Either way, doesn't matter. The TBU just stands for that terp-butyl group. What were the other special ones that we covered? DBU and DBN. All right, so those were the special bases that were resonance stabilized. And then the last one were the hydride bases. So sodium hydride, potassium hydride, and lithium hydride. These are all good bases that are really crummy nucleophiles. All right, and then we just covered the things that are good nucleophiles, which we said are things like halogens. Halogens are the classic example. We also said that thiolates are good examples, so sulfur-containing compounds, including just neutral sulfur molecules. Those are all good nucleophiles that are pretty bad bases. All right, when we think about something that's both a good base and a good nucleophile, does anybody have an example? Hydroxide, right? So hydroxide is similar to terp-butoxide. However, it's not bulky, which means it can act as both a good base and a good nucleophile. Another good example of this would be methoxide, but to a lesser degree. And you could even have ethoxide and argue that that's a pretty good base and nucleophile as well. The key is, with these, you don't want those R groups to be too bulky. So oftentimes what I do when I'm writing these is I say, these kind of fall in the subclass of R, O, minus, and then I'll put an asterisk here, and I'll say that this R group cannot be bulky. Basically, anything bigger than an ethyl group or more branched than an ethyl group, I should say, like an isopropyl group or a terp-butyl group, means that it's probably going to be a better base than a nucleophile. But a methyl group and an ethyl group don't take up a ton of space on that back end side. Yep? It could be a butyl, something like that, but it needs to be a straight chain. So an isopropyl being branched off of that position um, is pretty sterically bulked up. Um, it's kind of in between. It can do a lot of acid-base chemistry, but not a lot of nucleophile chemistry. Yeah, so it's not a black and white thing. It's kind of this series of grays, right? And we'll talk more about that later. All right, and then a weak base, weak nucleophile. Um, if we think about SM1 reactions, we wanted a weak nucleophile, and we said quite often that's a solvent, meaning that it's neutral and doesn't even have a negative charge. So a good example of a weak base and weak nucleophile would be something like water. Water can act as either a base or a nucleophile, but it's not a strong base, and it's most definitely not a strong nucleophile. The other thing that we could do is have any sort of alcohol. So that R group could be an ethyl group if we wanted, so ethanol, or it could be a methyl group as methanol. 
So we've got four main categories that we've got to consider. I will say it's one of the few things in this course where I'm like, this might be a good idea to memorize these, or at least be so familiar with them that it kind of comes to you second nature. But beyond that, I want you to understand the why, um, specifically with the good bases um, that are only good bases and the good nucleophiles that are only good nucleophiles. Make sense? All right, so now we get to go into reaction mechanisms again. Everybody's excited, I can tell. Oops. Let me change the view here. There we go. So we're going to start off with the E2 reaction mechanism and get into the nitty gritty details and we'll leave E1 till next week. So let's review E2 reaction mechanisms. What's the rate order for uh, E2? Second order reaction. So it's a concerted second order reaction. That's the first thing we know. We know that the rate is always going to be the rate constant, which is our little k, times the concentration of whatever base we're using. And in this case, we want our base to be a strong base. So I'm going to indicate that. So it's going to come out of that strong base list. Typically, we don't want something that's a, a good nucleophile. And then we also want to include our substrate. All right. When we're considering what protons the base is going after, we saw previously that we're always, always, always going to go after beta protons, right? And then I'm going to add on a bit more. The beta protons that are anti-coplanar to the leaving group get deprotonated. So I'll show you what I mean by the anti-coplanar positioning. So let's take an example of that. And in this example, I've got a leaving group down here. I'm just going to abbreviate it like that. I've got hydrogens coming off the alpha carbon. And then down here, I'm going to have a methyl group, so I'll abbreviate that ME, and an ethyl group right here. What I mean by anticoplanar is you see how this beta proton is in the same plane as the leaving group, but they're pointing in opposite directions? That means that they are anticoplanar. So same plane, but face opposite direction. OK. So you see how they're both um, regular lines? One's not a dash or a wedge, meaning they're on that same plane, meaning on the plane of the board itself that I'm drawing on. Make more sense? Where the ethyl group and the leaving group aren't on the same plane, so we can call those anticoplanar anymore. All right, so in this reaction, we're going to deprotonate that. And so we can show this using a generic base. I'm going to keep it generic for the time being and use just B minus. But often we want to choose a base that's non nucleophilic, so something like terputoxide, DBU, DBN, something like that would work well. So the first step we know is going to be grabbing this anticoplanar beta proton, and then it's like a series of dominoes falling over. This covalent bond will collapse down, form a new pi bond between your alpha and your beta position. And then in the next step, you'll jettison off your leaving group. The key thing is these all have to be in an alignment in order for the E2 reaction to occur. Okay, so when we're all done here, the hydrogens that were on the left-hand side are still there. We still have the ethyl group and the methyl group coming off the right-hand carbon, and this would be our final product for our E2 reaction, in addition to our conjugate acid, which in this case would be neutral, not a positive charge. Does that make sense? 
It is sometimes pretty tricky identifying that anticoplanar beta proton, so I'll show you tricks when it's not immediately apparent when they're in the right plane. Yep. So let's say the Levin group was actually the one with a wedge, and the hydrogen uh, was also a wedge. Would those still be anticoplanar? No, that's a good question. So if your Levin group's a wedge and your uh, beta proton is a wedge, they're not in an anticoplanar configuration, but I'll show you what to do if you're stuck in that. Because if you remember, sigma bonds can rotate, so you might have to spin it in order to orient it to be anticoplanar. They can be. I'll show you an example of that. In fact, let's do that right now. <laughs> there we go. So let's do a harder example. All right. So let's do this one down here. And I'm going to use bromine as my leaving group. And it's going to be attached to a central carbon here. I'm going to have a hydrogen coming off here. I'm going to have a D down here. What does D stand for? Deuterium, right? So D is just heavy hydrogen, right? It has an extra neutron. And then over here, we've got a hydrogen. Over here, we have a methyl group. And over here, we have an ethyl group. All right, so now if we look at our alpha carbon, it's the carbon with our leaving group. Our beta carbon does have a proton coming off of it, right? So I can highlight this and I can say, that's my beta proton. This is my leaving group. Are they anticoplanar to one another in this conformation? I don't think so. If I'm looking at the anticoplanar position, it must also be a line. So the deuterium in this conformation is anticoplanar to our beta proton, right? But if you remember, sigma bonds can rotate. And one good way of analyzing sigma bond rotation is by doing what? Newman projections. Ha, huh? you thought you were done. So let's go ahead and do a Newman projection. So I'm going to draw in my pretend little eyeball here. In fact, some people were confused by my eyeball, so I'll draw the little person looking down there. Okay, so we're looking down that, and let's draw the Newman projection. All right, so let's do the front carbon first. We know that the hydrogen on that front carbon is sticking up. We've got the two legs coming off. Which one's going to be over to the right? Is it going to be the ethyl or the methyl? It's going to be the ethyl, okay. So we'll pop that in. We've got the methyl down here. Then we'll do our back carbon now. All right, it's pretty clear that the deuterium is sticking right underneath. And then what's gonna be in this top right-hand corner? Hydrogen. And then over here we have bromine. So we know our bromine in this case is gonna be our leaving group. And we know that this hydrogen in the front must be our beta proton, it's our only beta proton we can pick from, so we've got to orient it so that that bromine is anticoplanar to that beta proton, right? But we can do that pretty easily. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to shift this bromine all the way down here. I'm going to shift this deuterium up here. So basically we're going to take this like a spoke and just spin around that back carbon. All right, the front carbon we know is staying put, so I'm just going to leave that as is. I'll have my ethyl group here, put my methyl group right where it was. We said that the bromine, when we spun it, should go into that bottom position. The deuterium, when we spin it, will go up here, and the hydrogen will be right there. So now our leaving group is anticoplanar. So let's make some notes on this. So the beta proton in that first Newman projection was not anticoplanar, but in the second one it is. Do we need to even bother with our third Newman projection? No, it doesn't matter. We've already oriented it so that we've got an anticoplanar beta proton. 
All right, so I'm gonna just box this off. We've done the hard work. Now what I want us to do is to take that Newman projection and to redraw it in a 2D bond line conformation. So we're gonna just take this entire thing that we focused on making and redraw it down below. We know it's gonna look pretty similar to the one on top. All we're gonna do is rotate that back carbon. So let's just keep everything on the front carbon in the exact same orientation. We're still gonna have a wedge and a dash up here, but we need to fill everything in. Oops, let me clean this up. All right, if we imagine that our little man or woman is looking down this alpha beta position, what's gonna be coming off of this green circle now? It's gotta be the bromine, right? We said it needs to be anticoplanar, and we rotated it so that it is. All right, let's do the same thing. What's going to be the wedge now? It's going to be the hydrogen, so we can go ahead and we can fill that in. And that means that our deuterium must be our dash, right? So we've reoriented everything into the correct and appropriate positioning for our E2 conformation. Now when we go ahead and we draw this, we can say, all right, our base very, very much wants to go after this beta proton that is anti-coplanar. So this base can reach over, grab this. We're gonna domino out our leaving group. Our leaving group was coming off this alpha position, our beta protons right there. So now we can go ahead and we can draw our final product. What I want you to do is to draw your final product and determine whether or not it's gonna be E or Z and then check with your neighbor. I'll give you a hint as you're working on this. Sometimes when I'm stuck on these, I go back to my Newman projection and I uh, will circle my groups that are on the same face. So you see how the deuterium and ethyl group are on the left-hand side and the hydrogen and the methyl are on the opposite side? That means in your final product, they're gonna be on the same face as well. So these should end up on the same side of an alkene. All right, so really quickly we can go ahead and we can draw this and we can say, when we draw this, we're gonna have a new carbon-carbon double bond. We can arbitrarily pick deuterium and hydrogen here. We know that those are going to be left over off of our old alpha carbon, right? After we kick off the bromine. Which one is going to be on the top side, meaning the side facing the deuterium? Yeah, it's got to be that ethyl group, right? So we can go ahead and we can plug in that ethyl group. All right, we saw in our Newman projection, the methyl group should be on the same face of the alkene as the hydrogen. So I'll go ahead and plug it in there. Another way of thinking about this, right? is using that 2D bond line structure with the dashes and wedges. When this cascades down, the methyl group and the hydrogen were wedges, so they're gonna flatten out onto the same plane, meaning they're gonna end up on the same side, and then the ethyl group and deuterium were both dashes, and when they flatten out, they'll end up on that same side as well. All right, so now going back to the original question, is this an E or a Z isomer? Z, Z yeah, if you remember, the easiest thing to do is to cut this in half, focus on this carbon over here, we'd say, all right, this carbon, deuterium, is higher priority than that hydrogen. And then on the other side, we could say we've got this blue position right here. Ethyl group is going to be higher priority than a methyl group. So Z isomer only. We don't observe any of the E isomer for this E2 reaction. We only get one product. It's kind of similar to an SN2 reaction where we only got one product as well. However, this isn't always the case, so we'll go back and we'll talk about that. All right, let's do another example. <laughs> that was quite the yawn. I don't know if that means that this is way too easy 
or if you're just really tired. <laughs> All right, let's do a harder one. All right, for this one, I'm going to use a terp butyl group here. I'm going to use a bromine. I'm going to use a hydrogen. I'm going to use a methyl group right here. And I'm actually going to color code these hydrogens. I'm going to do a blue one here and an orange one down here. If you notice, we've got two beta protons, right? So our alpha positions, the position with our leaving group, beta positions here. So when I look at this, I'm seeing either the blue proton can be beta or the orange proton can be beta, right? So it's a bit confusing. Which one will we choose? Or can we choose one or the other? Yeah, we could choose either one potentially, right? Because we could orient either one of them to be anticoplanar. So let's try to predict what products we would get out for this reaction. So just like we did before, what I want us to do is a Newman projection. All right, and in this Newman projection, like we did before, I want us to imagine looking down this bond in the front. And let's do the first one. We know the methyl group is gonna be sticking straight up. Is the orange hydrogen gonna be on the bottom right or bottom left? Bottom right. Okay, so now we can do that back carbon, back carbon like that. The bromine's gonna be over here hydrogen, and TBU, right? So in this initial confirmation, the orange proton is anticoplanar. So like I was saying before, the bromine being a wedge means that the other position can't also be a wedge because those wouldn't be in an alignment. However, a wedge and a dash are actually anticoplanar in this confirmation. So if we think about this, if this were to do an E2 reaction, we would get this final product. So let's do this underneath here. Actually, let's do the second Newman projection first. All right, let's draw the other Newman projection. In fact, I'm gonna erase this just for clarity right now. We're gonna move this hydrogen over here to be anticoplanar, this hydrogen up here, and this methyl group all the way over here. Like I said with Newman projections, it really doesn't matter which carbon you move. You can move the front one or the back one. So this time I decided to move the front one. All right, so now our orange hydrogen should be on top. Our blue hydrogen is going to be anticoplanar, and our methyl group will be in between there and there. All right, so we've got two possible confirmations where we have anticoplanar beta protons. where we have anticoplanar beta protons. Yeah. Why is that terbutyl for the orange hydrogen not anticoplanar as well? The terp in which one? The right one or left? The right one. On the right one, the terp butyl and that orange hydrogen are absolutely anticoplanar. But what we're looking for is an anticoplanar beta proton to our leaving group, to right? Our, oh. Our terp butyl is in a leaving group. We want something that's stable when it falls off. All right, so I'm going to erase these red arrows just for the sake of clarity right now. Are we equally likely to deprotonate the orange proton as the blue proton? Why? Discuss with your neighbor really quick. All right, so let's do a check-in. Who thinks that they're both equally likely to be deprotonated? Who thinks that the orange proton is more likely to be deprotonated? 
Who thinks that the blue proton's more likely? Ooh, we got a little bit of debate. All right, let's back up to earlier on in the term. Which is the more stable Newman projection? Ah, the left one or the right one? The left one, right? If we think about the right one, we've got a bunch of steric interactions, right? So we've got a Gauss interaction there, and we've got a Gauss interaction here. On the other one, we do have a Gauss interaction, but we only have one of them, right? So if you have the option, try to minimize your Gauss interactions. That means that this one is more stable, which means it's more likely that you're going to deprotonate that orange proton because it prefers to be in an orientation where it's anti to the leaving group compared to the blue proton. All right, so now let's go back and try to predict what our products will look like in this. And if you remember, I circled the groups that were on the same face, and I said that those will be on the same face of the alkene when the reaction's done. These will be on the same face of the alkene when the E2 reaction is done there. So let's go ahead and try to predict our two products. So I'm gonna draw this base with a negative charge. I'm not going to show the reaction arrows because we know we can alter the conformation of that. But what I like to do is just draw my carbon-carbon skeleton like this. We know we're going to get two alkene options out of this. All right, once we pluck off that proton, or sorry, the bromine on the, or ugh, let me rephrase that. Once the bromine falls off of the alpha carbon, we still have a hydrogen and a terp-butyl group left over. So I'll still fill those in. It doesn't really matter whether or not we do top or bottom. What matters is what they're paired with, right? All right, so on this one, what's going to be on the side facing the hydrogen for our major product? So I'll put major over here and then minor over here. It's got to be that methyl group, right? And we said that the more stable one is going to result in likely our major product. And we said the methyl group is going to be on the same face. And then what's going to be down with the terp-butyl group? The hydrogen, what color hydrogen? Blue. blue, exactly. So the blue hydrogen is going to be left over right there. So that's going to be our major product, the one that's most likely to form in this E2 reaction. All right, now if we think about our minor product, what's going to be on the same face as that black hydrogen? Up here, we've got our black hydrogen there. We said. The orange one's going to be on the same face, right? The blue one was actually plucked off during the E2 reaction for our minor product, all right? And then we said that the methyl group, in this case, will be on the same side as the terp-butyl group. So in this reaction, we'll actually get two different products. If we think about the one on the left, is it E or Z? It's going to be E. Do we have to use E for this one? Do we? Or can you use cis and trans? We could call this trans, right? Because we're comparing two hydrogens that are identical and they're on opposite faces. So because these are identical groups, we can compare them. We could say they're on opposite sides of the alkene. So we could also call this trans. Yep. No. As long as you have two equivalent, or sorry, two identical substituents that you're comparing, um, you can call it cis or trans. The fact that methyl and terp-butyl are different has no impact on the fact that the two hydrogens are the same. Yeah, good question though. All right, the one on the right-hand side, if we think about it, we've got two hydrogens on the same side. So we could call this Z or cis. So we're coming up with two different isomers of an alkene. What's the relationship? between these? Oh, I don't know. They're diastereomers, right? They're not mere images of one another. So we would end up with a mixture of diastereomers. you'd end up with more of your trans isomer than your cis isomer. And we saw that that's simply because 
of the uh, conformational analysis using the Newman projection. We want to minimize Gauss interactions. The other thing you may notice too is that the minor product is inherently less stable. We saw that earlier this term where these two groups are going to kind of feel each other in space. That makes it less stable and more likely to be your minor product. So you could also think of it using that logic as well. Does that make sense? All right, let's do a harder one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one's actually not as hard as you think it is, but it'll help you with your pod. got this cyclohexane unit. What would this molecule be called? Yep, or just bromocyclohexane, right? You could say one bromocyclohexane, but if you don't say the one, it's implied that it's going to be at the one position. So this would be bromocyclohexane. If we imagine treating this with a strong base, which of these protons will be deprotonated. Talk with your neighbor and see if you agree. Yeah. All right, let me stop you mid-discussion and say, all right, in the previous example, we did Newman projections for conformational analysis. What do we do for conformational analysis of cyclohexanes? Chair conformations. So let's draw the chairs. <laughs> All right, so you thought you were done with that. <laughs> Not quite, though. So let's go ahead, and I'm going to put the bromine. I'll just say that's carbon one. You can really pick any carbon for your chair. Pick carbon one, but make sure you're going clockwise if you're numbering clockwise in your original molecule. So I'll say one, two, three, four, five. Six. All right, carbon one. If we think about it, we should have an axial substituent sticking straight up, an equatorial one sticking out in a way. If we imagine that we're looking down on this molecule, meaning we've got a little stick man looking straight down on it, will the bromine be in the axial position or will it be in the equatorial position? It'll be axial. Okay, so we can put bromine right here. And then that black hydrogen off of carbon one must be equatorial. Okay, we also have an axial and equatorial off of carbon two. All right, the blue proton off of carbon two, will that be axial or equatorial? It'll be equatorial. And that means the orange one right here must be axial. All right, looking at it with this point of view, which proton is anticoplanar? The blue one or the orange one? Orange one. All right, so to me, it looks like these are anti-coplanar. However, we can do chair flips, right? We can do chair flips. It's illegal in California. It's been proven by the state of California to cause cancer. All right, so if you remember, feels like an eternity ago, we said we can imagine flipping this footrest up, this headrest down. So when we do that, our footrest, which was carbon two, is now our headrest. Make sense as review? All right, carbon one. If we think about carbon one, I'm gonna erase this right now, just so those dashes aren't in our way. For carbon one, we have an equatorial substituent that's going to be sticking out like that, and an axial one going underneath. Which one is the bromine going to be off of? The axial one sticking out and away, or the, or sorry, the axial one going down, or the equatorial going out and away? Equatorial. Okay, that means this black hydrogen must be axial like that. Let me actually squeeze this in a little bit. All 
All right, for carbon two, is our blue proton going to be axial or equatorial? It's going to be axial. And our orange one must be equatorial, right? So now what we're looking at is this bromine right here, and we're trying to determine whether or not there's an anticoplanar beta proton to it. Is there? It's a bit weird, right? This is honestly really hard to see using 2D bond line confirmation, but the blue proton and the orange proton are not in the same plane as that bromine, right? They're actually offset 60 degrees, so they can't be anticoplanar when that bromine is equatorial. The anticoplanar positions are actually right here and right here, so your carbon-carbon bonds are anticoplanar. You don't actually have a carbon hydrogen bond that's anticoplanar. Yep. So would, would the hydrogen coming off carbon six, one of those wouldn't be anticoplanar? So if we think about, oh, this should be a six over here, sorry. If we think about carbon six, let's go ahead and draw those in as well. So carbon six, we'd have a proton right here and a proton right here. So that's what you were asking about. They're in the exact same planes as those blue and orange protons relative to the bromine. So those aren't anticoplanar either. What about carbon four? They're not beta. See, so you do have to find a beta proton that is truly anticoplanar. This is the thing that hoses people up, right? You can only have anticoplanar beta protons in a cyclohexane when your leaving group is axial. Which seems a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because bromine's a relatively large atom, so we're forcing this to go through the less stable chair conformation in order to get an anticoplanar beta proton. But it's simply the only thing we can do in order to get that proton to be anticoplanar. All right, so now let's go back and do our arrow pushing. We already determined that the orange proton is anticoplanar when bromine is axial. So we can fill this in and we can say, all right, we can clamp this down, clamp down, kick off our bromine. Now when we do this, the black hydrogen off of carbon one is still there. The blue proton is still left over. We formed a new double bond right there. And this would be the only product that we would get out from this reaction. Does that make sense? So we get HB plus Br minus as our inorganic byproducts. This should help you with your pod. I will say with your pod, you're gonna to have to do conformational analysis of cyclohexanes again, but it's really good review for your final because that could be on the final as well. All right, I think that's where we'll leave today, but you're welcome to use these last few minutes to get a jump start.